the first big dinner we went to and it was just this crazy room of like, oh, Tom Hanks, Tim Robbins, Jamie Foxx. George Mackay, how are you? I'm really well, thanks. How are you? I'm great, thank you. It's lovely to see you. You've starred in so many incredible movies, which we're going to get into shortly, but let's take it right back to the start. A classic, Peter Pan. <laughs> yeah. I have serious curl envy of you in that movie. Well, you know, it was a perm. It was a perm plus a wig. And it was, it was called the Richard Roxburgh, the wig, because it was, that's an, he's an Australian actor, and apparently it was his wig. And they were curling my hair with tongs every day, because obviously I play curly and my hair is not, is a little, there's a little curl in it, but not, not enough to warrant the name curly. And, um, and they were doing it with tongs every day, and it was just taking too long. So they, they said, can we perm it? And at the age of 10, I had a fantastic perm. And then they would put a wig on top that was kind of like, had fair size holes in it, and they would just pull my hair through, so then it became the curly mass that was, you know, the curls that you envied, so. I feel, you, I'm assuming yours is the real deal. Mine is the real deal, but I'm surprised. I was like, what was George putting in his hair? Yeah. Well, uh, in Australia... It was natural. It, yeah, it was, and, and in Australia, we, which is where we filmed it, it, kind of, it was all kind of like a surfy part of town, and it was like a really strong hairdo, and then it just didn't quite have the same effect back at home, you know. But, uh, but I loved it. I loved it. I've, it's probably the, the biggest hairdo. We were saying before, all the hairdos. Actually, that probably, in fairness, was the biggest hairdo I've had. It definitely wins. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But Peter Pan was obviously your first movie. Yeah. What are your memories of walking onto a film set for the first time? Genuinely, absolute magic. Like, it was, it was such an extraordinary project. And it was, um, it was probably the mo one of the most, this sounds sort of a weird way of saying it, but kind of movie-esque movies. I've, of films I've, I've, I've been a part of because they, um, everything was built, everything was set. So the forest that we ran through was, was a set, was inside of a soundstage and they built these huge trees and the rocks was polystyrene and everything was made, which had its own magic to it. There's one kind of magic when you're on location and you can see the real elements around you, but I, I, don't, I don't know if I prefer it, but I think there is such a kind of classic film kind of magic to when absolutely everything is made from scratch and and in that case it was so it was um it was a real sort of profound experience and it was that it was i kind of got that part by chance really um and it was that experience that made me sure that i wanted to do this you know as long as i as long as i could wow but as a kid just stepping into that world it must have been like as you say a dream world yeah totally i mean because we were all kind of between 10 and 14 mainly or seven the twins were seven actually and so we we're just kind of usually you're playing in the park or in the woods or something bows and arrows and doing all the kind of make-believe stuff that all of a sudden you are then facilitated to do with but like now have this really cool bow and arrow and have this sword as well and why don't you climb on this pirate ship it was like it was an absolute dream for a bunch of kids to kind of go and and play because we were away from school we had tutoring on set and they kind of would I remember they had this wonderful thing as a science experiment. They brought in bin bags um, and balloons and string and all this stuff. And we were each given an egg and they got one of the lighting cranes and they said, your challenge is, is to, create, uh, to create a contraption that stops this egg from breaking when we drop it from that big crane. And so even the school was magic. Like it was, it was a really kind of incredible experience. Who needs real school? Who needs when real school when you, can, when you can have a big lighting crane and try and protect an egg? So, yeah, yeah. Those are the things that we need to know in life. Those are the important lessons. That's it, you know, who needs arithmetic and, and language when you can, you can keep an egg safe? <laughs> but aside from that whole incredible set and walking into this dream world, what else was it that made you really fall in love with acting? It was just the magic of, of, of all elements, but then there were also really kind of amazing times where we had a we had an acting coach called John Kirby who was a really wonderful man who was there to sort of help oversee and guide all of us kids who either were very young actors or like myself and a lot of them had never acted before. There was a sort of session where he took us and he would sort of help us talk through emotions and talk about things and, and a feeling of sadness and how to get to that. And, and I remember talking to him and we all shared that thing and we like, we'd all, in turn, we'd cry. And it was like a really sort of amazing thing to be kind of coached very gently by someone to talk about something that would make you feel a thing for real, but to sort of understand that you were doing it in a make-believe space. That was a real sort of profound memory that day when we were all in this, this room crying together. It sounds a bit sort of pretentious, but, but it was just that thing of, I think that's when like kind of, 
film or theatre or anything good is when it's sort of, it's truthful, but it's held within this make-believe situation. But what's inside of that situation at that moment is true. And that was a kind of really profound lesson that I always kind of remember. And you've obviously worked with so many incredible actors. Who did you really look up to when you were younger? Who did you almost want to be? I, I, think, I think it's more performances rather than actors. I remember when I was younger, I saw Gladiator and just thinking Russell Crowe as Maximus was so amazing. I remember seeing an interview with Joaquin Phoenix and being like, his voice is different. He, he has a different accent. And it sounds so simple, but as a, as a boy, that fascinated me that you could, you, he could change himself like that. I also like, loved Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet and John Leguizamo as Tibble in that. And I sort of didn't really, under, I've watched that film a number of times. And I think the first time I watched it, I was just kind of dazzled by him. But then you sort of realize as you're a bit older, he's, he's doing all this stuff, he's shooting like a sort of matador and there's this kind of like Latin sort of like vibe to it as well. And I, kind of understanding that all of this stuff has been pieced together to create this thing that just gives you a sort of like a feeling or an experience. <laughs> It's performances more than actors themselves. Um, and then when I was a wee bit older, as I was finishing school, I worked with an actor, Eddie Marzan, who's, who's an incredible actor and one of those guys that you just see, he's, be, he's worked so much. And his professionalism and his ability to kind of respect his craft um, and in turn respect everyone else on set and, and himself in the doing of it was a real lesson in, you know, you don't have to, you can take this seriously and not be an idiot, <laughs> you know, and not just sort of be really pretentious or whatever, but you can, you can have a respect for what you do and that can make you do it better and you can practice at it as well. Yeah! Bravo! Bravo! With something that's so sort of, it's quite an emotional way of, you know, kind of industry or way of living, I guess. And I didn't know that you could practice acting until I sort of, until I saw Eddie work and he was, yeah, he just did it so professionally and so kindly and so brilliantly. That was, I just, I will always look up to him. I find that so interesting. So are you someone that takes a role home with you at the end of a day's filming? Kind of, yeah. And I, but then again, all part of my sort of the practice of learning as you go, as I get older and, you know, your circumstance changes and things like that. And so you learning some jobs you absolutely do. And that is the experience of it that you kind of go, well, I'll, I'll live with a foot inside this character always um, and see how that feels and what that will bring to the work when I do go and when I'm actually required to do it and then also they're doing a less uh, kind of trying to learn the lesson of like that has its benefits for the work but it might also have its um, its troughs in terms of like your day-to-day -day life frankly so so how do you how do you do good work when you're there and also be sort of a responsible functioning like adult when you're not there <laughs> as well. So it's a, it's a bit of both. I've had jobs where kind of, you know, I've tried to take it home, jobs where you can't help but take it home and jobs where I've actively tried to be there and then not take it home. So, and that kind of moves and changes with the character at, at the time and what it feels like it requires I, and what your director asks of you as well. We've got to talk next about how I live now. Sam, out the way, girls in the van. No, you can't split us up. Eddie, don't. Move out of the way, stay away from us. This photo that I'm going to show you, of you, Saoirse and Tom is so cute. Oh, wow, that's such a lovely photo. Are you all still in touch? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen them all for, for a wee while. Um, I actually crossed paths with Saoirse because we were doing two different productions that were using the same base. Um, but that was such a, such a wonderful project and I made such dear friends on that. And, you know, outside of that picture, there are some of the members of the crew, which are some of my best friends now. Um, so it was a really kind of profound, uh, sort of wonderful job in, in terms of kind of like friends, friends through life. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a lovely picture, I've not seen that. And what's so amazing is you've all gone on to achieve so much in your careers. Oh, <laughs> yeah, all well, three of you. It's, I mean, you know, well, Saoirse had done so much by the time we, by the time we got there and just, I think she's, well, she's one of the best actresses around and I will always be sort of, um, I would always go and see something if Saoirse is in it because, because her, her taste and her, her quality of work is always a marker of stuff. She's, um, she's just brilliant. And Tom, to see what he's, he's done and doing is just absolutely amazing. It's a kind of pinch yourself moment to know, yeah, to know everyone, you know, that few, because it was a few years ago now. 
and uh, yeah, even for me to kind of to to, to know to know the guys a wee bit, um, to see what they've done and what they're doing is just brilliant. Was it your first pride? Yeah, first anything. Yeah, well, this is the best way. You need to throw yourself in. The thing is, is I'm actually from Bromley. Well, don't worry about that. We're a broad church. Pride is a movie with so much heart. I yeah. swear, I cry when Mark gives Joe the birthday badge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pardon the pun, but how proud are you of that movie? Yeah, very proud. Very proud. It was. Um, it was so, it's such a wonderful story and such an important story um, for, for the kind of the, the truth and the happenings of the story and, and the story itself, but also just the messages of it, of, of camaraderie and for uniting uh, uh, with a common good and, and finding a, um, a kind of a likeness and, and an empathy with, on people who on the surface perhaps wouldn't wouldn't kind of support each other, obviously, or be nervous to support each other. Um, and, and the love and the goodness that comes out of coming together like that is, is just, is such a wonderful, such a wonderful message and I'm so proud to have been a part of it. And I learned so much about life and about that kind of ethos from doing that film and being part of that story. And then also in terms of work, you know, there was, there was a kind of crowd of us young ones and then there was a crowd of these amazing experienced actors helmed by Matthew, our director, and, and Stephen, the writer, who, um, you know, there was so many kind of like professional and life lessons to learn from that, that time. I felt, I feel so grateful to be part of that. It's such a brilliant film. And I love how everyone calls Joe Bromley in it. Yeah. Do you have any fun nicknames? Oh, no, I, I wish I had. I really went through a phase of being desperate for a nickname and it never happened. So, no. I wish I had a nickname, um, but I'm still I'm still searching for it. I don't know I don't know what I would have to, today. It might be stripes or something like that. But um, I mean, if you can think of one, I'd, I'd happily take it. But it could be something related to all the different hairdos that we were talking about. Hair, yeah. I mean, we've got the strong mullet here. Str yeah. Maybe. I mean, there's there's a lot kind of there's a lot of kind of party in the back, but that's a strong ponytail too. But it's sort of. They sound a bit sort of, I just watched Top Gun recently and they've all got names like, you know, Maverick and, you know, all of those ones. It, like, <laughs> extensions doesn't, even for me, desperate for a nickname, doesn't quite, doesn't quite have it. Mullet I'll take, because it's kind of like a fish. It feels like there's more kind of dimensions to mullet. Next time we speak, I'm yeah. relying on you to give me a good nickname. Oh yeah, or if you call me mullet, I'll answer. Mullet? Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll perfect. do it. <laughs> me shouting down like on the red carpet, mullet, mullet. come over here. I'll, I'll be there, yeah. I'll be there, whether I've got a mullet or not. <laughs> um, can we please talk about Bill Nighy in yeah. Pride though? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know anyone who doesn't adore that man. Yeah. We're going to cut, cut it straight. T triangles. Is he just the dream? He's the dream. He's the absolute dream. He's such a... Such a wonderful man, like such a, I kind of, I was kind of, I was observing him more than I got real sort of time with him because the cast was so large. But I remember, um, I remember when he's doing that, that scene and he's talking about the, the, the Welsh coal and um, that effing Margaret Thatcher. And I just remember like, he, it, there was an ease about him and still so much kind of feeling and power in how, he's, how he said that speech. And it was just, um, and then in between takes, just how he was kind of telling stories and easy with himself. Yeah, there's a, there's a real kind of amazing ease about him, um, which is kind of a real pleasurable thing to be around. So he's, yeah, he is, he is indeed the dream. And he's so cool. He would definitely call you mullet. Yeah, yeah. If Bill Nye called me, if Bill Nye called me, I don't know, shoelace, I'd, I'd take it. Take it. Whatever Bill says goes. We should get Bill to nickname you. If you can arrange that, I will be a happy man. I'll get it tattooed on me. Perfect. Yeah. I'll give him a call. Okay, great. Sort it. I really hope he has a good one. He just always pops up on TikTok. Does he? TikTok are obsessed with him. Really? Yeah. I don't have TikTok, so I don't know. But, I mean, if whatever Bill does, goes. Yeah. yeah, if Bill's on TikTok, then TikTok must be great. A legend in all fields, including TikTok. Yeah, yeah. It goes through generations, cyberspace. He's everywhere. Don't die. I won't. Captain Fantastic is one of my favourite movies. I'm always recommending it to people. Oh. It's such a fresh and unique movie and I feel like in your career you've played so many diverse characters. Are there any characters that you'd love to revisit and explore further? Because I would love a Captain Fantastic too. That's really interesting. Um, I think Bo would be a really good one to revisit because he does so much learning in that film. Like He goes from that kind of sort of very particular existence of knowing so much but having experienced so little 
And when the film ends, he's about to jump off into what I can only imagine is, is a world of experience. You know, he's going traveling, he's gonna be on his own, he's gonna, he's gonna figure, you know, how he feels about the world, he's gonna explore the world. So I think the bow that comes back, I think that said, the way that the kids were raised in that film, in the story, I imagine he's, he'd still be very much rooted in himself, but I'd, I'd be very interested to, to, to play bow again, having had that more experience, basically, because I would have had more experience as well. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that'd be a good one, actually. I think Captain Fantastic, um, maybe if, maybe if Bo had a big family that he was raising in the woods, or yeah, maybe, maybe we could do that. I could, I could take over from Vigo. Yeah. Uh, Vigo could be the sort of, you know, the coolest granddad ever. And he would be. <laughs> and he would be. He would be the coolest thing. Whatever he chooses to do, would be the coolest at it. I'm calling a petition to make this happen. I think Bill, Nyman could, Bill Nye could be a shaman in the woods. Yes. Bill Nye as a sort of tattooed, nickname sort of kind of shaman um, with Bo as a father of a brood of eight children and Vigo as a granddad. I can so see this. I think, I think, I think it could work. This is genius. Let's get right in. Yeah, <laughs> genius. Um, speaking of different roles though, fans yeah. have said that they'd love to see you play Chamber, who's in the Marvel comics. Right. Would you ever be open to joining the MCU? I'd never say no to, to anything really. I, it's not, it's not kind of, it's not where my heart's at so far. I mean, that said, that the opportunity hasn't come hasn't come around. But I kind of I do love playing. I mean, there's a sort of. A, 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 I don't really know the Marvel universe so well. But I think my heart is more with the kind of, uh, not necessarily original characters because it is an original writing in itself from the comic books. But I think my heart is more towards the bows and the Neds of the world. But who who knows? I don't I don't know much about Chamber so. What's he like? He's a mutant. Great. Okay, that's yeah, a good start. Yeah, he has a special power with his chest where he wow. can like release energy. Okay, right. Okay. He sounds. He sounds cool. That sounds. To be fair. Okay, well, that's that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. yeah I, well, if we can make that happen too, I mean, we, you, you could you could get me in work for the next year or so. Listen, I'm going to need to be paid for all of this. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. All of these projects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just a small film that won a few awards. 1917. I was overwhelmed with emotion after I saw that movie, oh. as I'm sure the world were. Um, if your younger self could see that movie, mm. what would he say? I hope they'd just enjoy it. Um, because I, I think I was always, the biggest pleasure of being in 1917 was the kind of the mutual collaboration of it all. And then what that created was something really cinematic and something that was kind of an experience um, for the viewer. So I kind of just hope that the, my younger self, if they saw it, would, um, would just get lost in the experience. Um, and it's the type of thing like, I think I was always inspired by those kind of epics like, you know, like Maximus and things like that, you know, like those big battle scenes and things like that. Those, um, those, those films are, I, I was really kind of moved by and awed as a kid. So to, in a sense, be part of it growing up, I'd, I'd, just, I'd be chuffed and excited. <laughs> As you should be. Yeah. And going to the Oscars for a movie like that, which was so successful, must have been the dream. Yeah. What surprised you most about the Oscars and all of these award ceremonies? The amount of stuff that there is before the actual event, where there are dinners and drinks and parties and uh, different awards. And it's like a kind of whole season of promoting those, those films, which, um, which, which frankly, I just didn't know existed before. Um, so it was amazing to be part of it. It was, but to know that there was that much work in sharing the film was was a was a real eye opener. Are you someone that gets really starstruck going to these events? It was yeah, it was kind of weird. I remember being like the first big dinner we went to, and it was just this crazy room of like, oh, Tom Hanks, Tim Robbins, Jamie Foxx, um, all of these people like that that you're then. You're, you're just, you're nearby and it's, kind of, it's just a weird thing where it kind of actually also normalises them because you've seen these people forever and you're like, well, I'm here and eating a bit of bread and having a meal and there they are too. So they must be having a meal too. They eat meals. Like they're not this kind they're of like real. kind of strange species of people. They're just people. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it was a kind of leveller in a sense to go, oh, they're just, they're just people that people that you, who have, you know, who you've watched for, for a, a long, long time, but they are just, just people. Um, but it was kind of amazing to sort of have that first go at like, there were so many of them in that, I think Tarantino was there, it was just a big dinner. And I didn't speak to any of them, but, but you, you just saw them like kind of 
like when you're on the tube and you see people down the carriage and it was just like, oh, there's a, another big director and a big actor and a big musician and a big, it was just, yeah, it was kind of mad. I love the thought of that, like an Oscars lunch is like being on the tube. Like, yeah. oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's Tom Hanks. Everyone there, yeah. There's that sort of proximity <laughs> as well, so, yeah. My blood pressure was through the roof watching I Came By. <laughs> in the best possible way, though. Good, good. Well, I'm glad you're healthy now, but I'm glad it also raised the blood pressure. There are so many twists and turns. I was watching it with my mouth wide open. Do you remember the last movie that made you audibly gasp because you were so shocked by the ending? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, I'm just trying to think what it was, but it was for a kind of different reason. It was like a, it was a kind of like blood scare. It was like a kind of, it was a wound. I remember it happening. I know it's a, it's a weird one, but the one I always remember that makes me kind of... Have you ever seen that film Blue Crush about the surfers? I've not seen and it. So I think it's Kate Bosworth. It's like a girls' surf competition. But she has this nightmare about wiping out and hitting her head on the reef. And they keep on playing this thing when she goes on the, on the rocks. And it's this horrible kind of crunchy And that always gives me shivers. Thinking about it now gives me shivers. So that wasn't the last one, but that's the biggest one that's kind of given me a jump oh, scare. It's already given me shivers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, watch it. It's great. Yeah. There's some great sort of pipeline scenes, but yeah. We see how Toby in this has nothing is true, everything is permissible on his wall. Mm. Do you have a quote that you swear by? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no. No, I don't. Um, I don't I don't think I do. What is it like? Well, there's, it's a bit wanky, but that... Isn't it, isn't it a Samuel Beckett quote, like, fail again and fail again better? Um, fail and fail again better or something like that. That's quite a good one That's for, good one. you know, for trying stuff and kind of being okay that like, yep, yeah, failed, just you're going to fail again, but just try and fail a bit better. Um, so it kind of makes you not so scared. Um, so I like that one, if it is Beckett. I might be misquoting it now, who knows. But what I like about the quote in the film of, of, of nothing is true, everything is permissible, is as, you know, when you watch the film, and what I like about Toby is that he's this kind of like, he's so right on with what he thinks. And, and ultimately he is true to himself and to his beliefs. But that, that quote is something that he kind of, as the plot unfurls, he starts to go, no, I don't think that's right. I, and he allows himself to kind of, to change his views, to kind of go, there are some things where actually that, I can't permit that. And then as the more we talked and the more we made like Toby this kind of anarchist, it was kind of like, well, what about when you fail institutions? Like what if, he's not doing what's best for his family and what is what like and and kind of that uh, that flip side of the coin kind of opened up that that sort of at least that conversation within the character as to like you know yes if i'm if i only think one thing i'm kind of just as bad as the other person who only thinks one thing and and that sort of like that leaves that kind of conflict leads for good uh, leads to good drama but i guess maybe there's just at least a bit of kind of openness into understanding the other side of what the kind of um you know, the, the opposite to what the way you may think may think can sort of like, I don't know, can be the seed of, of a bigger conversation, perhaps. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I, I liked I liked that quote and I like it was a very kind of clear line that it sets Toby on. But also I like that he can start to kind of reevaluate that as he meets, as his world begins, because I think he believes that up until someone takes it to a level that is beyond anything he's ever experienced, which is, you know, how things play out. I was exhausted for you watching this. <laughs> Did you do anything after a day's filming to like de-stress? No, you're kind of wired in a good way. It's sort of like you're kind of up there. Um, and it was a kind of short, sharp shoot. So it was, and Toby's kind of like that kind of, he's a bit wired anyway. So I kind of, that's when in a sense you sort of keep a toe in it where you just kind of go with the feeling of just go on that buzz and kind of can't wait for the next day of, right, yeah, yeah, I just, I'll go to sleep for a little bit and then I'll carry on, you know? So um, yeah, it just, just, yeah, kind of just kept with that feeling. Mullet. Mullet. It's been a oh. pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you. Do Thank I call you, you curly? so much. Like, you can call me Curly. <laughs> yeah, right. Mullet, Curly. Mullet, wavy, you know, there it is. No. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. It's been amazing hearing about your incredible career and all of these amazing movies. No, thanks for talking through it all.